So before I begin, I would like to thank Alexander Jarman and Brittany Salyers from the museum for inviting me here and for arranging my travel and for being such warm and welcoming hosts. It's, um, it's exciting for me to be lecturing in this, in this gallery surrounded by some really terrific paintings. It's the first for me. So tonight I'm going to talk about performance and mediation and politics. In 1986, a British anthropologist by the name of Victor Turner wrote a book called The Anthropology of Performance. And in this book, Turner asks, if we are sapient animals, homo sapiens, tool-making animals, symbol-using animals, we are no less performing animals. And he coins the term homo performans. We're performing animals not in the sense, perhaps, that circus animals are performing animals, um, but in the sense that we're self-performing animals. Our performances are, in a way, self-reflexive. In performing, we come to reveal ourselves to ourselves. We know ourselves by observing and participating in performances. But what counts as performance? Dance, certainly. But what about everyday life? What about lecturing and spectatorship, museum visitor visiting? Beginning in the late 1950s, Alan Capro, who taught for many years at UCSD and was um, one of my mentors when I was here as a student, um, Capro expanded the definition of what counts as art to include all kinds of activities, opening a door for what became known as performance art. So following people on the street could start to be thought of as a kind of performance. Here we see Vito Acconci in his famous following piece where he would pick someone at random, follow them through the streets of New York until he could no longer follow them because they went into a private space. And he would document his followings in letters that he would then send to his friends. Also, having a friend shoot you in the arm could count as performance. And perhaps even parking cars. In 1994, when I was still a student at UCSD, I was invited to participate in Insight, which some of you may remember. Uh, not quite a biennial, but a periodic um, multi-site art project where artists would do different kinds of interventions, both in San Diego and in Tijuana. And I was invited to do something at South Southwestern College in Chula Vista. And I collaborated with Nina Kachadorian, another artist who was then a graduate student at UCSD, and Stephen Matheson on this project, which um, is probably best explained by this video. I got you. <laughs> if you drove by Southwestern College in Chula Vista today, you might have thought you were seeing things. You were. Cars parked according to color in the lots there <laughs> today. More than 3,000 cars. The project was a work of art sponsored by the college's art gallery and organized by three local artists. Drivers were directed to the correct lot by color coordinators as they arrived this morning. The artists did their homework ahead of time, counting cars and tallying colors to figure out how much room to make for each color. Okay, you're gonna go to the beige parking lot. It's right up here. The beige? In the, yeah, you're gonna go to beige. And it's the D parking lot. It's like three parking lots there. We've actually taken a place that people don't think about spending time, which is a parking lot. Somewhere very boring, somewhere you try to avoid, and turned it into a place which might be somewhere to go and actually take a look at what's there. Separating out the colors involves a lot of cooperation on the part of people. And there we kind of get into things like, you know, it's sort of a social experiment. Beige is a color that has many variations. People have been wonderfully cooperative. Occasionally a red car has popped in and we've been told don't resist people too much. Persuade them and if they insist parking a red car in a beige lot, go ahead. <laughs> Stand out like a sore, like a boil on a finger. <laughs> 
It's interesting. I'm awaiting the outcome to see what it's gonna be. Why are you in this lot? <clears throat> because they don't have any purple and the closest thing they could come up with is electric blue. Are you offended? Not at all. You like being electric blue? No, I like being purple. Hi. Hi. What do you think about this? I think it looks pretty good. Hi, what do you think about this? Uh, it's really nice. Hi, what do you guys think about this? It's bullshit. Why? <laughs> gotta get the car? Gotta get the car. So before I continue, I want to just divert from my script for a moment to just talk about, just for a second about my experience as a student at UCSD. It was, I think it goes without saying, one of the most formative experiences in my life as an artist. I got to spend more than four years getting my MFA at UCSD, which is really unusual. MFAs are usually two or at the most three years, and it, it gave me the time to really find myself as an artist. When I came here, I was still making paintings, and I remember the first thing that everyone said to me when they found out that I was a painter, they said, oh, you'll stop painting, you know, soon <laughs> enough. Um, but, but in the audience um, tonight are both some students um, from UCSD and also some faculty, in addition to Michael Trigilio, Babette Mangolta, for whom I served as a teaching assistant, and Steve Fagan, who was my advisor and who played a really pivotal role in my own development as an artist and who's retiring shortly. So um, I'm happy to be able to welcome him to New York City where he's moving this summer, but you all, I'm sure, will miss him um, terribly. But back to my script. So Victor Turner, British anthropologist, we come to know ourselves by observing and participating in performances. More often than not, our observance of performance is, in fact, indirect. Sometimes, as when we stumble upon a public artwork, our experience is immediate. Um, but more often than not, it's mediated by television, by radio, by print media, by the internet. Alan Capro might have called Car Park a happening. I like to think that Joseph Boyce would have described it as social sculpture. And from the perspective of the Insight curators, it was site-specific public art, but it was also decisively a media spectacle covered by local television networks and even national TV in, in Mexico. So most people um, experienced it vicariously. Their experience was mediated. And in the mid-1990s, when I was finishing up my time here at UCSD, the media industries were on the brink of a major transformation, the rise of the World Wide Web as the popular medium that we know today. And like a lot of young artists, I was interested in what we were, at that time, just starting to call new media art. And I believed, perhaps naively, that the internet could and probably would flatten the hierarchies of the art world with museums somewhere close to the top of that hierarchy and artists just graduating from MFA programs somewhere near the bottom. Um, I hoped and believed that the internet would flatten these hierarchies by allowing people to create their own horizontally distributed networks so we could talk directly to each other and so that artists like me could gain direct access to audiences without the mediating apparatus of the institutions. I saw curators and even museum educators like Alexander less as facilitators to help me reach people, but at that time more as gatekeepers who were keeping me out, right? So in 1996, I started Rhizome, an online platform. We're looking at the original uh, page. An online platform where people who were interested in new media art could exchange ideas and information and begin to develop a critical dialogue about these emerging art forms. Uh, the idea was to create a discursive space in which we could develop a critical understanding of new media art practice. And this is what um, the Rhizome website looks like today. Um, Rhizome is thriving as a nonprofit in which I'm tangentially involved as a member of the board of directors. Um, and it's in residence at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, kind of like an organization in residence there, but still an independent nonprofit organization. Lately, since, 19, uh, since 2006 approximately, I've been interested in the performance of protest, and that's been the main subject of my work. Um, thinking about protest 
as a public performance of politics, as a way in which some people choose to perform their politics in public. So we observe performance through media, and we perform for media. How does mediation transform the performance of politics? How is politics performed today differently from the performances of the late 1960s and early 1970s, the new left moment that cast such a long shadow over contemporary political life? In 2006, I began a series of public reenactments of protest speeches from the Vietnam era called the Port Huron Project. I staged six reenactments in all. Each took place at the site of the original speech, where the original speech was given. The speeches were delivered by actors uh, and performance artists. We have some Howard Zinn fans in the audience. Two audiences of invited guests and passers-by. So this speech was originally given by Howard Zinn in 1971 and staged a reenactment in Boston Common in 2007. The most well-known speech that I reenacted was originally given by Paul Potter, who himself is not so well-known. He was the president of Students for a Democratic Society in 1965. Gave a speech to about 20,000 people on the National Mall at the first March on Washington to end the war in Vietnam. The speech is called, We Must Name the System, and it was such a powerful speech that it was republished many times. Perhaps what the president means when he speaks of freedom is the freedom of the American people. But what has this war done for freedom in America? It has led to even more vigorous governmental efforts to control information, to manipulate the press, and to pressure and persuade the public through distorted or downright dishonest documents. The president mocks freedom if he says that this is a war to defend the freedom of the Vietnamese. Perhaps the only freedom this war represents is the freedom of the war hawks in the Pentagon and in the State Department to experiment with counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare in Vietnam. So um, in the summer of 2008, I concluded the series with um, three speeches. Uh, the first was originally by Cesar Chavez in Los Angeles, next. And the speech was uh, delivered anew by Ricardo Dominguez, another professor from UCSD and also a performance artist. Next. Then a speech that Angela Davis originally gave at a Black Panther rally in Oakland in 1969. Next. Now this um, this park, Defermery Park, also known as Bobby Hutton Park in West Oakland, is still a really vital um, uh, location in this mostly African American, mostly low income community. So in this case, I had to be particularly sensitive and not just you know, come in as the sort of parachuting political artist to reenact their history for them, assuming they'd be very happy I did, and then sort of you know, walk away and take credit for it. So um, I did a lot of work. Um, you know, visiting with members of the community and talking it over and sort of checking to see if they liked the idea. And in the end, it seemed to work pretty well and um, um, had a lot of engagement. In fact, um, one of the um, Black Panthers who was mentioned in the speech actually came and, and was in the audience. And finally, a speech that Stokely Carmichael gave in New York City um, outside the United Nations in 1967. So I looked for speeches that were given by activists, not public officials, that were given outdoors in public spaces so that my reenactments could be accessible to the public and serve kind of as interventions in public space. And also speeches that had some resonance with what was going on at the time, the war in Iraq. Um, the speeches often had this kind of spooky uh, relevance. And it was interesting, you know, people would applaud in the audience. And it was unclear to me whether they were applauding the talents of the actor reperforming the speech or more applauding in this kind of time warping sympathy um, with the, you know, the sentiments of this original speech, doing this kind of real time uh, substitution of Iraq for Vietnam, for example. Next. So um, I videotaped these speeches and made the videos all available on YouTube and other media sharing networks. Also showed them in museums as uh, single channel projections. Next. Um, got to show them in Times Square on what was then the largest video, high-definition video screen in the world, 
through a partnership with Creative Time, a wonderful nonprofit arts organization in New York that focuses on art in the public realm. Um, so they were able to program the video to appear on this screen that was owned by MT MTV. And they also um, commissioned and presented the last three reenactments in 2008. Um, and I should also mention that the project um, was funded by um, Creative Capital, which is a, a wonderful arts funding organization. Next, please. This is what Thank appeared on that screen in Times Square. We have been so absorbed in our own struggles that we have not participated in an active way in the battle against the war. Why do our children take up guns to go kill their brothers in faraway lands? In our case, thousands and thousands of poor brown and black farmers go off to kill other poor farm workers in Southeast Asia. Why does this happen? Perhaps they are afraid. Perhaps they have come to believe that in order to be fully a man, to gain the respect of other men, to make their way in the world, they have to take up the gun and use brute force against other men. But we are also responsible. Some husbands prove to their children that might makes right every time they beat their own wives. Some of us honor violence in sports, if not at home. We insist on our own way, we grab for security, and we trample over others in the process. But we are also responsible in a more basic way. We have not taught our children to sacrifice for justice. Say what you will about the Army, but in a time of crisis, the Army and the Navy demand hard work, discipline, and sacrifice. And so our sons go off to war, grasping for manhood at the end of a gun, trained to work and sacrifice for war. For the poor, it's a terrible irony that in order to rise up out of their misery, they have to go and kill other poor people. But what have we done to show an alternate way? Talk is cheap. Our children know it. It's the way that we organize and use our lives that tells what we believe in. Farm workers are at last struggling out of their poverty and powerlessness. They are saying no to an agricultural system that has condemned them to economic slavery. At the same time, they are creating another way of life for their children and themselves. They are taking their sacrifice and they're suffering and are creating a powerful campaign for justice and dignity. Their nonviolent struggle is not soft, it's not easy, it requires hard work and discipline above all other things. So we must work every day, week after week, month after month, year after year if necessary, outlasting the opposition, using time to defeat them. That is what it takes to bring change in America today. Nothing less than discipline, organized, non-violent action every day will challenge the power of the corporations and the generals. But people have to decide to do it. Individuals have to decide to give their lives over to the struggle for specific and meaningful social change. And as they do that, others will follow, their children will follow, the young will follow. And if we offer the young an alternative out of the energies and resources of our own lives, perhaps fewer and fewer of them will seek their manhood in affluence and war. And we, And we, together, can bring about a day 
when our children will learn from their very earliest days that in order to be a man, fully a man, and fully a woman, means to give one's life to the liberation of the brother who suffers. It's up to each one of us, and it won't work unless we use our own lives to show the way. Muchas gracias. As powerful as these speeches are, my intention really wasn't to engage in a kind of nostalgia trip, you know, to think when I was reenacting these speeches in 2006, 7, and 8, how much better things were when there was this massive social movement that really believed it could, you know, change the world, you know, as, as there was in 1968, 69, and 70. Um, but more to try to think about, um, about how protest has changed. It did seem at the time, you know, um, in 2007, 2008, that protest was futile. You know, that there was nothing, no matter how many people took to the streets, um, that we could do to change, you know, the course of the war, for example. Um, things maybe look a little bit different on the other side of, of Occupy. Um, but what I was really interested in is, is how the place of protest in political life had changed and the role of media in affecting that change. You know, in, in 1968, people gathered outside the Republican, sorry, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago and sat down and chanted, the whole world is watching. And there were three networks, and they were watching, you know, and there was this massive audience um, that was paying attention. And, you know, today, you know, the dream of participatory media has been realized. Everyone can have their own TV channel, but audiences are tremendously fragmented, and it really wasn't clear, you know, how um, the message of protest um, could, could resonate. In any case, we should move on. Um, so I showed also the, you know, video in these two-channel installations. Next. But then my, my um, interest shifted more to contemporary protest. And I began to um, assemble a kind of informal archive of video clips depicting interactions between police and protesters. Um, I collected a lot of clips. I shot some of them myself. Um, I gathered stuff shot by activists, by indie journalists. And um, I also accessed video shot by police of interactions with protesters by working with civil rights attorneys who, who um, represented protesters. Um, I focused this archive on protests that took place in the U.S. and Canada between 2003 and 2010. Next. Next. And one more. One more. And this is how I first exhibited it. So clips from the video are being projected, rear projected onto the glass door of a gallery. And when visitors entered the gallery, the video would turn off and the lights in the gallery would turn on, revealing an empty room, an empty gallery space, with these locked flat files. that were labeled with the names of different um, activist groups operating in the United States. Why Port Huron? What was there? I'm sorry? Why Port Huron? What was in Port Huron that you're naming projects after Port Huron? The Port Huron Statement was a book-length manifesto written by Students for Democratic Society, um, published by Students for Democratic Society in 1965. And it discussed student apathy and laid out a vision for participatory democracy that was kind of the, uh, the strongest American voice in the discourses of the New Left. But it, did it have anything to do with Port Huron, Michigan? They met in Port Huron. Oh, is that what? Okay. Thanks. So the, the operations of this installation to me, mirrored the interplay of exposure with so many video cameras at these protests, video cameras carried by activists, by 
journalists and artists like myself and also by police, but also occlusion, the way that um, access to the video is often quite difficult. Um, I also have shown material from this archive in performances, like the one we're going to see tonight. The first one was in Paris at the Cinema de Cineas. Next. And here's a little clip from yesterday's rehearsal. So I'm really thrilled to be working with Michael Tregilio uh, on the performance later on this evening. Next. So um, just very quickly, um, what I'm working on now um, are two projects. The first is called Posse Comitatus. And it looks, well, you know, so in those previous two projects, in the Port Huron project and in the Dystopia Files, I was looking at protest as a kind of performance of politics. And I began to think about how politics is performed on the right, on the other end of the political spectrum. And I was drawn to the militia movement, which, um, interestingly enough, arose in um, 1995 and 1996 following um, the militarization of the FBI and the ATF and the law enforcement actions that took place in Waco and Ruby Ridge. And a number of people on the libertarian right um, became really concerned about the militarization of, of police and decided to take arms, um, kind of echoing the militias um, of the American Revolution. So I became really interested in these militia groups and I've been collaborating for the last year with another artist who lives in New York, Chelsea Knight, um, documenting, filming, training exercises, working in particular with this one militia group uh, in upstate New York. What we're most interested in is how they actually perform their politics in their training exercises, in their embodied actions. And we're working this summer with a choreographer in St. Louis to translate the performances we're recording into into dance, and um, if you can go to the next uh, slide, you can, if you you this can't just be laying footage. out bars, you have to take breaks in your burst. Right. Somebody's gonna be overlapping. Control your overlapping bar. You know what I mean? Like tell your guy, like, hey, you're shooting three shots, but he's gonna shoot two, so you can actually communicate. Otherwise, it's just you're gonna all empty mags at the same time. Right. Again, this is, this is raw, unedited footage that we're going to show to this choreographer, and then he'll work with his dance company to develop a dance performance out of that. Um, we'll then um, uh, film the dances being performed in rural areas near St. Louis, and then present the performance, the dance performance in St. Louis in September, and then a video installation combining our original footage with footage of the dance um, at a gallery in Montreal in October and November. Um, and then the, the other project I'm working on right now, next slide, is called Rare Earth. Now, as I was doing research on the militia movement, I became interested not only in the performative actions, the movements, you know, how they run with guns and stand and things like that, um, but, but also in the landscape. And, and thinking of landscape as a kind of um, symbolic ground or almost a stage on which um, these fantasies, these paramilitary fantasies are, are enacted. And as I was um, doing my research, um, I found that a lot of militia groups post videos of their training exercises on YouTube. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar, when you're watching videos on YouTube, YouTube recommends other videos for you to watch. And YouTube started showing me videos of people playing first-person shooter video games. 
So when people play first-person shooter video games, they often record their gameplay and post it on YouTube. And in those video games, well, they're strikingly similar. Basically, it's guys running around in the woods you know, with guns. Again, this kind of um, projection of military fantasy into this um, you know, lush natural landscape. So I went back to the training ground uh, a few weeks later and shot several static landscape videos. This is one of five. And then I also began making photographs in first-person shooter video games, in games with military themes. Um, video games have come a long way since I was a kid. I'm not much of a gamer myself. Um, but the contemporary, the current generation of video games have these incredibly vivid and convincing landscapes that are um, evocative, actually, of you know, some of the landscape paintings in this room. And also downstairs, there are some Hudson River School landscape paintings, like by Asher B. Duran, for example. So um, I've got an exhibition up right now at a gallery called Momenta Art in Bushwick, which is a kind of new art neighborhood. Well, it's, a, it's a neighborhood that's been there for a long time, but it's been infiltrated by artists uh, recently. Um, I've got an exhibition uh, with six of these photographic prints. Next. and also um, one of the videos, the video I just showed you. Next. So it's interesting to think about how, um, you know, ever since well, when I first became interested in new media back in, say, 1993, there was all this cyberpunk fiction being written by people like William Gibson, uh, who wrote Neuromancer, and Neil Stevenson, who wrote Snow Crash. And there was this idea that cyberspace would be this immersive, virtual reality environment, what William Gibson called a consensual hallucination. You know, instead, we ended up getting something much more closely resembling hypertext, pages of documents occasionally with video uh, and photographs on them. Um, but it seems to me that, that just now, in the last year or two, has that sort of fantasy of a collapse between the virtual, you know, the simulation and the real started to happen. And I think it's, it's particularly evident um, with the advent of drones which, you know, the, the, the Air Force recruits gamers to serve as drone pilots. And they spend all day in these trailers in places, you know, Air Force bases in Las Vegas and Syracuse and, and elsewhere, flying, you know, playing these simulations, which, as we know, actually, you know, kill people in the tribal territories of Pakistan and in Yemen and elsewhere. Um, and the, the pilots are getting PTSD, you know. And, when you know, some of the members of the militia that I'm documenting in upstate New York are quite young, you know, 1920, the leader is 24 years old. He served three tours in Iraq, and he has an Xbox at home. You know, and I'm thinking about when he's out there in the woods leading these training exercises, is he re-performing something that he did the night before in a video game? You know, what's the relationship between gaming and reality? There seems to be this, this collapse. Next slide. And at the same time, it's just bizarre that these landscapes and video games are so rich and beautiful and aesthetically satisfying. Next. So here's just a shaky iPhone video showing the installation at, um, or the exhibition at Momenta. So I've printed them fairly large. The smaller ones are two by three feet, approximately, and the larger ones are about four by six feet. Um, and framed them, treated them as one would treat photographs. Technically, they're high-resolution screenshots, but I, I call them photographs, and I, I, think, I think of them as, as photographs. The experience of making them is not so different from making the landscape videos. You know, the real videos I make by tramping around in the woods with a real camera, and the video game photographs I make by exploring these video games and then you know, pressing a, a virtual shutter.
So interestingly, when people see the exhibition, they tend to assume having seen the prints. And when you first see these prints, for, at first they look like photographs, and then you quickly realize they're not photographs. They look maybe more like photographic reproductions of realistic landscape paintings. <coughs> and then, you know, especially the younger viewers realize that they're computer-generated images, CGI. Very few people identify them as video games or as being from video games. But having realized that they've seen these very realistic images that are, in fact, computer-generated, they come in and see that video and assume it's also simulated, but in fact, it's not, right? Um, in any case, we're just about out of time. Next. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time.